by the Spirit we also should walk. Let's turn to Our Lady first. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, e benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc in et ora mortis nostre. Amen. Mary, most meek and mild, pray for us. What St. Paul invites you and I today to do is to live life by the Spirit. Live in God's Holy Spirit. And this means that we must not speak of only things in a spiritual way, but to do those works which are inspired by that same Holy Spirit. If we have this life of inward grace moving in us and driving us forward, as St. Paul says, Caritas Christi Origit notes, that is the love of Christ compels and impels us forward, then we also have to live our life outwardly by, as the Holy Spirit teaches us to do so. The Greek word that is used here is to, means to follow a settled plan or to set one's life in order according to a settled plan. And so what we will seek to do here within this sermon is we hope to set out a practical rule of life for attacking particular vices, particularly of anger and of wrath, as well as the correction of evils in others so that we can live fruitfully as an entire family of faith. In particular, what we'll seek to do here is to instruct fathers and mothers in correcting children, but this has application beyond fathers and mothers to all of our relations, which we have to, if we're going to be good Christians, to give fraternal correction. So what does it say here? We'll focus on that first reading here today. Your good pastor shared with me that he'll be focusing upon the gospel, so you won't miss out on the gospel if you follow what he has to say about living according to life and death, which are set before you here within the gospel. What does it say in Galatians? St. Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in any fault, you who are spiritual instruct one another in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. St. Paul doesn't instruct us to treat in this meek manner obstinate sinners. In fact, St. Gregory speaks of it this way. He tells us that those who are obstinate sinners, because they sin deliberately, they're actually supposed to be rebuked sternly. And Tertullian continues it saying, because of their hard hearts, they must be broken and not soothed. But St. Paul instead is referring to those of the family of faith who are struggling because they are weak in their sins, struggling in that way. The Greek word that is used there for fault denotes an accidental fall. It speaks as one who trips because they're thoughtless of what is going on in front of them over a stone or because they're not paying attention, they fall into a ditch. That's what that word means. And so this passage tells us when we're dealing with struggling and weak souls that we should instruct and restore them to health. But how are we supposed to do this? This is usually where we struggle. Our mode of restoration and instruction that we choose is usually what gets us into trouble with other people and loses us friends in this way instead of earning us them. The way in which we go about it often harms relationships. So how should we do it in order to not harm relationships? St. Paul instructs us in this way. He says correction must be made, quote, in a spirit of meekness. In a spirit of meekness. Now, what does that word meekness mean? Have we spoken on that to you before? When he says this, it is to say that we are to correct one another in a spirit of gentleness, in a spirit of tenderness, in a spirit of kindness. Meekness, brothers and sisters, is not a display of weakness, but it is rather power which has been placed under control. Meekness is not striking with full force, but only with so much strength as is necessary to redirect a soul toward the path that leads unto righteousness. Meekness never satisfies our anger, which always seeks a self-righteousness. But it always satisfies, meekness does, God's patient mercy, which fulfills his true way of righteousness. 
If you're taking notes, that might be something that you want to write down. Say it again, meekness never satisfies our anger which seeks a self-righteousness, but it always satisfies God's patient mercy which fulfills his true righteousness. St. John Chrysostom reminds us that this is a gift that is given to us by the Spirit, which follows from what St. Paul says, that we are to live life by the Spirit, living and acting in his Spirit. St. John Chrysostom says that the Holy Spirit breathes into the one who uses his gifts, God's own mildness and kindness. Realize that rebuke is like a bitter medicine, bearing away the disease, so that we should always seek to sugar over that difficulty with mild words and a sympathetic temper so that its bitterness may not be tasted. Oftentimes when we're corrected, there's a bitter reaction that happens to us. So it is on the person who gives the correction to make sure that they sugar it over in such a way that it might be received well. St. John Chrysostom beautifully states it in this way, saying, quote, Our speech becomes the speech of Christ if throughout all of it we imitate his kindness. If you want to begin to speak like Christ, you've got to sugar over everything with the kindness that comes from the Spirit of Christ. In fact, St. Dionysius says it another way, saying, quote, if, he says, it was the meekness of Moses which won for him the special intimacy with God. And he adds further on, if pastors feed Christ's flock with similar meekness, they will show thereby that they love Christ above all things, and it will so be accepted, those pastors will be accepted by him. In quotation. At the end of one of his letters, that same Saint Dionysius relates a vision that was given to another saint, Saint Carpus. And this is what vision happened. You see, Saint Carpus was bitterly enraged against a heathen that, was seduced, that seduced two Christians to go away from the faith. And he was so full of anger, this Saint Carpus was, that he wished to do that malefactor a grave violence, even to strike him physically. For this reason, Christ, the Lord, appeared in a vision to St. Carpus and chided him, saying this, quote, The Lord said to him, Strike me, for I am ready to suffer again for man's salvation and to suffer it gladly, if only other men do not sin. Our Lord God would rather us strike him than even to strike a heathen for doing that which is evil. Take that to mind next time that another one who doesn't follow the faith injures you or those you love. Listen to the words of St. Augustine. St. Augustine, he tells us how you and I should administer correction in this lengthy quote. He says, quote, The task of rebuking other sins is never to be undertaken except when after self-examination our conscience assures us in the presence of God that we do it simply out of love for the offender. Love, and then what, say what you will. He says, love, and then say what you will. In no other way will that sound, that which sounds like a curse, be a curse indeed. If you recollect and feel throughout that your only wish in using the sword of the word of the Lord is to be the deliverer of your brother from the very snares of sin. End quotation. So what he's speaking about here is that we should never undertake in the slightest bit to correct our brother unless we do so from a spirit of love, seeking, realizing that he is suffering greatly under sin and our help is there to help him along. Not to show him that he's wrong, but to see what we can do to turn him back from that sin out of love, to save him, as he says, from the snares of sin. But what if a feeling of impatience or a feeling of anger overtakes us while we're administering our rebuke? What should we do then? Well, St. Augustine is most wise. He knows exactly and anticipates our question there. And so he continues on with this for that particular objection. He says, quote, Let us bear in mind that we ought to not be rigid towards sinners, since we ourselves sin even while rebuking sin, inasmuch as we feel angry with a sinner more readily than we feel pity for his misery. 
What should drive you and I to correct our brother when he's sinning? It's not that he's failing. It's not that he's doing evil there. We should feel angry over, we should feel rather pity because he's in the misery of having fallen into sin. And so that pity is, should be the very thing that drives us to correct, not anger. Remember what the Lord says. He says, the anger of man serves not God's intentions. Vengeance is mine, he says, and I will repay. It's not your job to repay. Again, St. Basil speaks about this in his rule, chapter uh, number 51. He urges superiors and all who engage in the work of healing spiritual diseases that they should take a lesson from natural physicians. And so he says, quote, Do not be angry with the patient, but rather attack the disease. That's something to take note of. Do not be angry with the patient, but rather attack the disease. How often within our lives, when we give correction to anybody within our lives, do we become angry with those who are disobedient, or with, rather than with their disobedience, which is like the sin of witchcraft, as it speaks in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31? What about you parents? When you discipline parents, how do you do it? How do you enact discipline within your families? Do you give your children the power over you so that they might frustrate you? Do you descend to the level of your children and lash out in anger just as they would lash out in anger against you? Do you give the child room within your heart so that he can utterly disturb your peace? Let no one gain access to your heart, dear parents, except for God alone, except for the saints in heaven. Let those alone, your own spouse, give access to your heart, but not your children in the way to destroy your peace. Realize that all of this, brothers and sisters, is in your control, dear parents. And it need not be so that you let them destroy your peace. Who is the child and who is the parent? Who has the authority and who is the one who is the subject? Is the family structure in your particular household one of a democracy? Or is it an oligarchy? Or rather, is it a monarchy? How do you set your rules within your house? Dads and moms, take up your authority. Reestablish that familial monarchy, and then right order will be set apart within your family. You embody in the family all the branches of government in your persons. You don't share it with anybody else, certainly not with your children. You alone have the legislative power. You write out all the decrees of the rules which must be followed. You alone are the judicial branch. You judge violations of the law according to correct justice in the way in which you see it. You alone are the ones who are the executives. You mete out the punishments and deal them out strongly. The appeal to the Supreme Court is only an appeal to you and your right judgment. Again, this is you. Now, yes, when you deal with your children, you shouldn't be as cold and as legalistic as maybe our judicial system is here within these United States. It's a family, of course. But realize that all the power is yours, and so if you wish to have right order within your families, take back that power. Use it as it is. Set your family right by setting apart your family structure as the monarchy that it ought to be. You are empowered to train up these children by God. Remember what Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says. I was taught to memorize this as a young child myself. It says, quote, Train up a child in the way that he should go, so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is why you instruct and teach your children, is it not? Not so that your power might be felt, but so that their lives may be well and they may prosper in Christ's law. Again, remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 through 13. It's a long quote, but give your ears to listen to it. It's powerful in ordering your own hearts and your families. So what does it say? It says, quote, For what children are not disciplined by their fathers? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not a legitimate son not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, 
and we respected them because they disciplined us. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best our fathers did, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. Now here's the one to pay attention to, verse 11. It says, For those who have been trained by it, no discipline seems pleasant for a time, but it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and a peace for those who have been trained by it. End quotation. My mom had me memorize that part, verse 11, and on over and over again. It was played on a CD over and over again, so it stuck within my heart. No discipline seems pleasant for a time, but it's painful because it ends up in a soul learning not what law-following is, but lawlessness. And so the rest of their lives are lived in order, but those who've been trained by it know what it's like to be restrained, and so peace rules their hearts and their minds if they've been trained in discipline. And so your children will only know that they are loved when you give them that good discipline. You know, not all children are the same within a family, right? Each one has their own particular temperament. They don't all need the same level and degree of parenting as others. Some need more discipline and some need less discipline. Some need the rod so that they will not be despoiled. And others just need a stern glance. And that's enough to correct their behavior. And this is good. It is a good thing to realize this fact, to discipline your children differently one from another because each one of them are different. Is that not the way in which you know from your own experience, dear parents? Each child is different, and they don't come with instruction manuals. You have to figure that along the way. This next part from that same scripture passage, Hebrews chapter 12, is for you in particular, parents. And so take courage from it. St. Paul says, quote, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather they may be healed. In quotation. What it's saying there is, parents, take up your authority. Don't feel that you need to be weak kneed before your children, for God has given you a divine authority, and in disciplining your children, you're exercising a divinely given right, a divinely given charge for which you will have to give account to before God Himself whether you've done so well or not. So take that up with strength and do it recognizing that you are doing something given to you by God. This is a message for you parents, not my way of correction and to be struck by the preacher who's preaching now, but to be encouraged, to be strengthened in what God has given you, to take it up for right ordering of your children. You must discipline your children, so don't be afraid to do it. Your desire is to heal the disobedience of your children, So therefore, do it with great love. Your rules must be firm and consistent and lovingly and calmly applied. Your kids will easily adjust to that after a while. Every child wants and desires discipline. They want and desire rules and boundaries to be set up within their lives. They test boundaries so that they can know where the limits of love are. And you establish those limits of love by your discipline, dear parents. Be encouraged as you set those up, even if it is not appreciated now. For it is not usually appreciated now. But for those who have been trained by it, a harvest of righteousness and peace is stored up for them. The only thing to note further for you parents is what it speaks in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. And that is to say, addressing fathers, St. Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged and aggravated, and thus despise your authority. That is but to say, this meekness, which we are trying to inculcate within you, meekness of trying to teach you within the sermon, so be patient. Don't be an ogre with your children. They still need to be able to see you as one they can run to for consolation, not only to receive the rod. Give them in your own wisdom, which God has given you, as you ask the Holy Spirit for it, the firm kick in the pants that they need from time to time, but at other times, so they can receive that firm embrace, you know whichever one is needed in the particular moment. If you desire, we can give you a greater teaching just on this, but let know, parents, that we support you in your discipline, and we pray for you, pray for you often in training up these children the way they should go. 
Continuing on, after declaring the importance of meekness, what St. Paul says here within this scripture passage, he says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What he says here is he says he wants us to move from addressing all Christians in general to appeal to each one of us as individuals. This is an admonition against judging others too harshly. God allows those who fall who are hard toward others. The saints give us ample proof of older men who reproved with excessive severity their juniors for lust or some other sin were themselves smitten with that same passion, passion that they may learn to have mercy upon others. In fact, one of the fathers of the church, an abbot, mentioned that in three things he had judged his brethren. And so God allowed within him that through those same three things that he might have a great fall in order that the heathens that were around him might know for themselves that they were only human, just as he was only human. A humble man realizes how easy it is to fall, saying, well, he's fallen today, I might fall tomorrow. Or again, to say, I am merely a man, nothing human beyond me is within my power to fail. I can fall like anybody else. St. Gregory the Great also talks in his 34th homily uh, on the evangelist, saying, quote, True righteousness is merciful. False righteousness is unforgiving and harsh. You're a good pastor, and I read an account just a few weeks ago from St. John Cashin illustrating this very point. What does he say there? He speaks about a young monk who is strongly tempted toward carnal relations. And so he went to another older monk for advice, asking him, because he seemed like he was standing so strong, maybe he could help him to overcome this thing and to give him advice as he goes further. But that older monk, he was bad-mannered and void of discretion. And so this older brother excoriated and scolded and upbraided him bitterly for his impure imaginations. And so because of that, This young monk, this younger brother, was wounded so badly that he lost his heart. He was discouraged and was determined to return to the world and to give his life to marriage instead of this holy vocation which he had already been living for some time. There was a wise, discerning abbot by the name of Apollo who could see exactly what was going on, and so he went to that younger brother. And with gentle words, he consoled him and assured the young brother to remain true to his vow that in time and through prayer, if he returned to it, this too would pass and God would restore to him the chastity which he sought to live out. And then he went and stood outside the cell of that older monk and he prayed fervently outside the door of his cell that God would subject that same monk to the temptation which this younger monk had and he went to him for advice. God granted that prayer. And so after a short while, that older monk became completely distracted. He became wild with agitation and temptation such that he could no longer return to prayer himself and was seen to be vigilantly agitated. And when this abbot Apollo saw that older monk in total distraction in that way, he went to him and upbraided him rightly, telling the old, older monk that God had sent him that temptation, the very same one of the younger monk, that he might learn to feel for those who were younger, so as to not to drive them to despair, as he had recently done to that younger monk. If you want to know more on that particular passage, you can turn to some scriptures which say the same thing, that of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4, or Matthew chapter 13 verse 20. Thinking of yourselves, do you wonder why you struggle with such violent temptations and distractions within your prayers or within your daily life? Could it be because you so harshly judge others within your heart? Could it be because you quickly criticize faults of another person with a critical eye? Could it be because you harshly reprove your children or your subordinates out of anger instead of using meekness to rule your actions? Repent of this. Repent of each of these things and convert letting mercy and discernment and meekness be your new modus operandi, lest tragedy worse than this should befall you and you should move from a bad place even to a greater worse place. 
In fact, St. Augustine helps you and I to overcome these things by offering us, offering us three excellent rules in order to properly correct our neighbors and our children. This is what he says. He says, quote, Great care must be taken that when duty compels us to correct anyone, we should think first. Are we honestly without fault in this particular sin of the past? Or do we even struggle with it now? Secondly, if we have been addicted to that same sin and now are not, let some thought of our human weakness touch our minds so that our approaches may not spring from hatred, but rather from pity. And will our efforts succeed in reforming the offender or only avail to confirm him in the very evil in which he is practicing? For the issue is uncertain. In either case, we may be certain that our own eye is single. Break for a moment to explain what that means, because that's in written in older language. What he's saying here, he's saying that we must check our own internal bias of our heart. Because when we want to correct somebody, what we will always think is, yes, I'm correcting the right spirit, that my words will help this person convert because they are coming from my heart and my heart must always be good. But experience tells us that's not always the case. We often had bad timing when we correct somebody. Or we have a bad manner when we seek to correct them. Or we are not the right person in that right moment to correct them, which will only make things worse. And so to examine ourselves first before we engage in the act of correction. Because God may indeed wish somebody else who will be better able to correct that person to come around later. And so if we find we're not the person to correct them in that moment, well then what should we do? Pray that God will send the right person to correct them in the right moment in the right way, which is beyond our capability to do at the present moment. The third thing which he offers for correction is this. St. Augustine says, quote, If, however, we find on reflection that we ourselves are guilty of the same fault as he whom we undertake to correct, let us not rebuke him nor scold him, but only mourn together and invite him not to obey us, but to unite with us in guarding against the common enemy, which is that same sin. Isn't that good? When we correct one another, to correct not one, one another as one who is scolding, not one who is the greater, not one who is the teacher, but to realize that we're all together fighting against sin. We're fighting against these all things and to show share from our experience that I'm struggling with that very same thing that you are, maybe not to the extreme that you are, but together we can make it. Together we can overcome these things. In fact, husbands and wives, rather than scolding one another when one of you fails to live up to your marital duties, join one another. Remember, you bear this cross of the marriage vow together and so we're to lead one another gradually and progressively together in this very same difficulty so that the two of you come to the same end together in Christ. One further note on this, when you correct one another, it must be genuine. It must truly be genuine, not to merely have these thoughts, but it must proceed from a genuineness of spirit. For if you do it in a way that seems to be condescending, no good will come of your corrections. That's why St. Paul says in the very next verse, bear you one another in your burdens. And so let us bear one another in our weaknesses, in our weaknesses of others. Do you bear one another's irritability and hasty words? Do you also reflect that other people must put up with maybe your remote moroseness or sluggishness of your temperament? Reflect that your neighbor's failings are a greater trouble to him than they are to you and so sympathize with him as he has to struggle with his own difficulties as well as those he bears from others in the world. In fact, St. Basil's interpretation in his rule is still more to the point. He says, quote, Sin is a burden pressing on the soul, nay, weighing it down and dragging it down to hell. And so, sin is the heaviest burden man can be called to bear, as St. Augustine says in his 22nd homily. He says, quote, See the man laden in the burden of avarice, and see him sweating under it, gasping, thirsty to make his load heavier. What do you look for, O miser, as a reward for so great a labor as yours? What do you toil in doing thus? And what do you long for? Merely to satisfy your own avarice? It can oppress you, 
but you cannot satisfy it? Is it by any chance not grievous to you, so much that you have even lost the power of feeling? Is not avarice so grievous? If not, why is it that it wakes you from sleep and sometimes presents you from sleeping at all? Perhaps, too, with it, you have a second load of indolence. And so the two most evil burdens are pulling you in different directions. They do not give you the same orders. Indolence says sleep, while avarice says arise. Indolence says avoid the cold, and avarice says bear even the storms of the sea. The one says rest, and the other, far from allowing rest, forbids you to cross the sea, and so to venture onto unknown lands. In fact, St. Augustine takes it further, adding this, saying that Christ takes away this burden of lust and puts in its place one of his own yoke of charity, which does not weigh down, but like wings added to a bird, enables the oppressed one, its possessor, to rise. And so our Lord calls to you and I today within these readings to make sure that we bear one another's burdens rightly, to make sure that we seek to correct one another not out of a harshness of heart, but always with a meekness of mildness, seeking to let the kindness of Christ be our single motivating force for lending correction to anyone else. And so do parents, to make sure that when you correct those who are under your charge, that you take up that task willingly not allowing your children to frustrate you or to descend to their level to act like a child yourself, but to rise to the level of the monarch, the king and the queen that you are placed over this household, and to let God's kindness to rule over you in such in that meek way to lead your family unto all righteousness. If you feel that you lack this in any way, where should you go? Go to Our Lady. Our mother, she has all the graces in which she herself lives. She is the one who is meek and mindful, tender-hearted in every way. And if you feel that you lack it in any sense, when you beseech it of Our Lady, especially through praying her most holy rosary, asking her for that very same gift, does she not accompany you and I along the way? Does she not descend, rather than condescend, descend to come to your level and mine and to walk you and I through it as we struggle as parents? You think that you lack this or any virtue? You go to her who contains them all. For even as mothers and fathers, as you sorrow over the sins of your dear children, who has greater sorrow than that of Our Lady, who seeing you struggle in your way to correct them? Our Lady is always upon your side, and so we seek her. Ask her for that grace, and so let us pray for one another, bearing one another's burdens now, as we pray this Ave together, asking her to be our help and our shield and lead us unto all that mildness and meekness as she followed in honor of her son. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.